What is an atom? Have you ever wondered the answer to that question? What is an atom? Atoms are the basic building blocks of matter. Almost everything that we see in the world today are composed of atoms. For instance, if you take a strip of zinc metal and if you cut it in half and you keep doing this repeatedly, eventually you'll break it down into atoms. All metals are composed of atoms. Water is made up of molecules, such as H2O. A molecule is a tiny particle that is composed of multiple atoms. So in a single water molecule, there are three atoms, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. In oxygen gas, which is part of the air that we breathe in, it's composed of oxygen molecules. This is known as a diatomic molecule because it only contains two atoms of the same type. That is two atoms of oxygen. Now let's talk about the structure of an atom. So here is an illustration of an atom of helium. Helium contains two electrons, two protons, and two neutrons. The electrons, which carry a negative charge, are located outside of the nucleus. They form the electron cloud. Inside of the atom is the nucleus, which is composed of neutrons and protons. Protons are positively charged subatomic particles, whereas electrons are negatively charged. Neutrons are neutral. Inside of an atom, the electrons are moving very, very fast. But here's a question for you. If they're moving so fast, why don't they just fly away from the atom? Why doesn't that happen on a regular basis? The reason being is it's due to the electrostatic interaction between the protons and the electrons. Opposite charges attract one another. So the proton is attracted to the negatively charged electron. They feel a force of attraction that accelerates them to each other. So even though the electron wants to move in this direction, it feels a force that pulls it towards the nucleus. And that force acts as a centripetal force. And so it keeps the electron in orbit around the nucleus, much in the same way as the moon orbits the Earth. The moon wants to fly away into outer space, but Earth's gravitational pull keeps the moon in orbit around itself. So that's why electrons, they orbit around the nucleus. It's due to these interactions, the speed of the electron that wants to make it fly away from the atom and the electrostatic force that pulls it towards the, the center of the atom. And those two things keep it in orbit. Now, the equation that describes the electrostatic force between charged particles is this equation. It's equal to K times Q1 times Q2 divided by R squared. Q represents the magnitude of the charges. If you increase the magnitude of the charge, the electrostatic force between them will increase. The second thing is the distance. If you decrease the distance, the electrostatic force will increase. K is a constant, so we really don't have to worry about that in this discussion. But let's compare two situations. Let's say we have a proton and an electron, and let's say they're separated by a distance of one unit. And let's say that these two will be attracted by some force F. What's going to happen if we reduce the distance by one half? How much greater will the force be? Would you say, I need to change this color. Would you say the force will increase by a factor of two or four if we cut the distance to a half? Based on this equation, notice that F is inversely related to the square of the distance. So when you decrease the distance by one half, the force will increase by a factor of four because two squared is four. 
So the force of attraction will be four times as large. So what does this tell us? Whenever you bring charged particles very close to each other, the force increases. The electrostatic force greatly increases. So now this raises a question because inside of a nucleus we have two protons that are very close to each other. The electrons on the other hand are very far apart from each other and they like it that way because like charges they repel. So electrons want to stay as far apart as possible to minimize electron repulsion. But in the nucleus the situation is different. The protons are next to each other and so whenever you have two positively charged particles next to each other there is a huge electrostatic force that wants to rip them apart. So in order to keep them together, there must be another force that holds the nucleus together. What is that force? We see that the electrostatic force wants to pull apart the protons, but what is the force that keeps them together? The force that holds the nucleus together from flying apart is known as the strong nuclear force. And it takes a lot of energy to keep charged particles close to each other at that distance when they want to repel. And this is why nuclear reactors can generate so much energy. There's so much energy involved in splitting the atom is because of the strong nuclear force that keeps the nucleus in an atom intact. The sun, for instance, generates a lot of energy through nuclear fusion. It fuses hydrogen atoms into helium releasing a lot of light and a lot of heat. So the strong nuclear force is very powerful. And now you understand why the nucleus is held together by such a force. It's not pulled apart by the electrostatic force. But now let's talk about the electron. So we understand why the electron doesn't fly away from the nucleus. But why doesn't it fall into the nucleus? Well, the speed of the electrons keep it in orbit. So that's one reason why, for the most part, it doesn't fall into the nucleus. However, for certain unstable isotopes, sometimes the electrons do fall into the nucleus in a process known as electron capture. So this is when the nucleus captures an inner electron. In this case, the electron combines with a proton to form a neutron. And you get other elementary particles like a neutrino and maybe a gamma ray. But for the most part, to keep it simple, the electron combines with a proton and creates a neutron. So there are times where the electrons do fall into the nucleus. But now let's talk about some other things, like the mass of a proton and a neutron. One proton has a mass of 1.673 times 10 to the negative 24 grams. And the mass of a neutron is very close to the mass of a proton. It's about 1.675 times 10 to the minus 24 grams. So a neutron is slightly heavier than a proton. An electron has a very small mass. It's 9.109 times 10 to the negative 28 grams. So the mass of one proton is approximately 1836 times more than the mass of an electron. So in terms of mass, electrons are relatively tiny compared to protons and neutrons, which means that the majority of the mass of an atom is in the nucleus of the atom. And the nucleus is very, very tiny. The atom is mostly empty space surrounded by tiny electrons. A neutron is approximately one atomic mass unit. And the same is true for a proton. But one atomic mass unit is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24 grams. So these numbers are not exactly the same. But you could say that one neutron has a mass of approximately one amu. And the same is true for a proton. Now, when using the periodic table, let's use carbon, for example. 
there are two numbers that you want to be aware of. In the periodic table, the top number is known as the atomic number. The bottom number is known as the average atomic mass. Now let's talk about that. Carbon has many different isotopes. Isotopes are basically the same type of element, just a different form of that element. So isotopes of carbon are carbon-12, which really should be written this way, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Now carbon-14 is a very rare isotope. On Earth, it's the amount of carbon-14 is negligible. About 99% of carbon atoms on the Earth is carbon-12. Approximately 1% is carbon-13. So to calculate the average atomic mass, what you would do is take 12, multiply it by 0.99, and then take the mass of carbon-13, which is about 13, times it by 1%. And this will give you the average atomic mass of carbon on Earth. So the average mass of carbon on Earth is 12.01. It's close to 12 because 99% of carbon atoms that you'll find is it has a mass of 12. So this is what is known as a weighted average. So if you had a sample of 100 carbon atoms, 99 of those carbon atoms will be carbon-12. One of them will be carbon-13. So the average mass of that sample will be 12.01. Now, another way in which elements can be represented is like this. So carbon-12 can be represented this way. This would be carbon-13 and carbon-14. So these are the different isotopes of carbon. Now, the bottom number, as was mentioned before, is the atomic number. The top number, notice that this is 12, not 12.01. This is the mass number of the isotope. Not the average atomic mass, but the mass number. Now, with this information, you can calculate the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons in an isotope of carbon. So the number of protons is equal to the atomic number. So in this case, carbon-12 has six protons. The number of neutrons is a difference between the mass number and the atomic number. So it's 12 minus 6, which is 6. Now, when dealing with an atom, the number of protons and electrons are the same. So the number of electrons will be the atomic number minus the charge. And atoms are neutral. Because they have equal number of protons and electrons, they have no charge. So in this case, the number of electrons will be 6 in carbon-12. So carbon-12 has 6 protons, 6 neutrons, 6 electrons. In the case of carbon-13, it has 6 protons because the atomic number is still the same. However, the number of neutrons is different. It's 13 minus 6, which is 7 but the number of electrons will be the same. For carbon-14, everything is the same, but the number of neutrons. So isotopes are basically particles of the same element with a different mass number and also a different number of neutrons. So that's how isotopes are different. Now let's compare atoms and ions. On the left, we have an atom of aluminum. You can tell that it's an atom because it's electrically neutral. On the right, we're going to have an ion. An ion carries a charge. In this case, a 3 plus charge. In both cases, the atomic number is the same. So both of these particles have 13 protons. The number of neutrons are the same. It's going to be 27 minus 13, which is 14. However, the number of electrons is not the same. For an atom, atoms have equal number of protons and electrons. Ions, they differ. To calculate the number of electrons in an ion, it's going to be the atomic number minus the charge. So the aluminum 3 plus ion, which is known as a cation, 
Positively charged ions are known as cations. Negatively charged ions are known as anions. The aluminum cation has 10 electrons. So ions, they differ in the number of protons and electrons, but atoms have the same number of protons and electrons. Atoms are electrically neutral, whereas ions are charged.